My name is Jean-François Dufour. I am the head of the hepatology at the University Hospital of Bern, Switzerland. Bern is the capital of Switzerland. It is in the middle of the country. It's a re relatively small town, but it is a very nice town to live. The Swiss Liver Center is part of the University Clinic for Visceral Surgery and Medicine. We see the whole spectrum of hepatology, from the very common frequent liver diseases to the most complex, difficult interdisciplinary cases and rare liver diseases. I have with me a fantastic team of senior hepatologists, very competent, very nice, very dedicated. You will hear today Professor Andrea de Cotardi, who is an expert on cirrhosis and ascites. You will hear Professor Annalisa Bersicotti, who is an expert on non-invasive assessment of liver disease. We love to have with us fellows, physicians in training and students. We like to transmit our knowledge. We also like, as academics, to create new knowledge. You can come to visit us in Bern, or you can visit our internet site, www.swissliver.ch. Dr. Christina Marcini is with us since uh, 15 months. She selected a case with interesting aspects that she will present it now. Dr. Marcini. Thank you, Professor Dufour. Uh, today, I would like to present you a case of a female 64 years old who re was referred in November 2012 uh, for suspicion of cirrhosis of unclear etiology at our center. She was uh, basically asymptomatic and she had elevated liver tests for about 15 years. Her medical and personal history included overweight since she was uh, 30 years old. Uh, she had since, uh, since 2015 diabetes type 2, arterial hypertension and dyslipidemia. In 2005, she was admitted at the hospital for nephrolithiasis and in August 2012, she had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy uh, where a nodular liver surface was described. In her medication, we can see um, uh, blood, blood pressure medication and also medication for diabetes. On the physical examination, we can see that she was uh, obese. Uh, she had uh, a high blood pressure. She had a waist conference over 100 centimeters, spider navy, um, and ad no other signs like edema or ascites. We performed liver stiffness by transient elastography. And, that and it was shown that the patient had a liver stiffness of 31.3 kilopascal. An abdominal ultrasound performed in January 2012 shown hepatomegaly and a diffuse epirechogenesis of the parenchyma, no focal lesion and a spleen of 12 centimeters. On the laboratory point of view, we can see that uh, bilirubin and INR were basically normal and albumin was slightly reduced. As for liver tests, ALT were light ele slightly elevated uh, as well as alkalice phosphatase and gamma GT. We can also see that platelet count was low, 136, and that cholesterol and uh, um, glycate hemoglobin were elevated. A biopsy was then performed and in the bi biopsy it was shown that the patient had a fibrosis F3 and 20% of steatosis. A gastroscopy performed on the same year showed no viruses. So my first question in this case is, does this patient really have cirrhosis? And for that I would like to really hear the, quest the, the answer of Professor Berzigotti. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. I think this is really a key question whenever you assess a patient with compensated chronic liver disease. And this patient has obviously an FLD in ASH, and recent data in this population confirm what has been seen in other population and really confirm that the endpoint from a <clears throat> histological point of view that we should be able to identify is the presence of cirrhosis. As you can see here, patients with cirrhosis on histology are at, are at a much higher risk of developing uh, liver-related uh, complications and, of course, of dying in the follow-up due to their liver disease. So we should be able to identify this population. And 
In any uh, chronic liver disease, we should go step by step from less invasive tests to more invasive tests, trying to really uh, focus on which is the stage of chronic liver disease of the patients. Whenever we assess a patient with chronic liver disease, we should be able to point out the stage which uh, in the induces an increased risk of liver-related events and, of course, disease cirrhosis. And you see in this slide that this holds true also in patients with nephrolinesh. And to identify cirrhosis, we should go step by step, beginning from less invasive tests to more invasive tests. And physical examination is the easiest thing we can, uh, we can assess in patients, and this patient had some spider navy on physical examination, and this already points to a very likely uh, stage of cirrhosis or compensated advanced chronic liver disease. We, can, we, we also saw that she had a slightly decreased platelet count, and if we calculate Nephrolde fibrosis score, we would see that this patient has a Nephrolde fibrosis score of 2, which uh, identifies her as a high probability of having an advanced fibrosis. We also had a liver stiffness measurement by transient elastography that was definitely elevated with a value over 30 kilopascal, and this again confirm, confirms that the phase, the stage of fibrosis in, the, in this patient is certainly uh, an advanced stage, and moreover, since non-invasive tests are continuous tests and quantitative tests, we can already say that the likelihood of a very advanced phase of, of, of fibrosis in this patient is high, and probably what we should do in such a situation is not only identifying cirrhosis, but trying to stratify the risk of complication in the follow-up. And we know that the main driver of complication in patients with compensated advanced chronic liver disease is the presence of portal hypertension, and so what we should ask to our test is trying to identify this complication. And we know from previous uh, works in the field that have been nicely uh, summarized in the last Baveno consensus conference on portal hypertension that we can try with our non-invasive test to identify which patients are at, at risk of having clinically significant portal hypertension and related complication. And the value that best uh, summarizes a high risk of clinically significant portal hypertension on liver stiffness measurement is a cutoff of over 21 kilopascal. This patient has 31 kilopascal, so I would say that she definitely has a very likely uh, stage of clinically significant portal hypertension, and then it makes sense in this patient to go on with the screening and surveillance for the most common complications that are uh, esophageal viruses and hepatocellular carcinoma, bearing in mind that this patient has certainly a higher risk of developing clinical complication, clinical decompensation, and HCC. Thank you very much. I would like to go further with our case. So, yes, we um, performed HCC screening and was also performed uh, varices screening. Um, the gastroscopy, as I said, was negative. During the HCC screening, a new uh, 70 millimeter uh, lesion was found in segment two in September 2013 was then performed an MRI uh, on the, in the same month, and this lesion was um, suspicious for HCC, and the liver was constituted by multiple regenerative nodules. So my next question um, that I would like to ask is to Professor Lufour is, does this patient really have HCC? Good question. Well, I mean, this patient is actually accumulating some factors to have hepatocellular carcinoma. On one side, you say it, she's a woman, though she has the risk, which may be slightly lower than in a man, because, you know, the ratio is 1 to 3, 1 to 5. But on the other side, we just heard that she has an advanced uh, fibrosis, or probably a cirrhosis, which is the main risk factor. But she has also a factor which has been associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. You mentioned to us that she was overweight and for a long time, and she has a diabetes. And here we have two factors which really play a role in the development of hepatocellular carcinoma. There's a very large literature on that, but I will just cite two works on this. There's a big uh, article on 173,000 veterans with diabetes mellitus, which have been matched with three veterans without diabetes mellitus, and they have been followed for over 
10 years. And you see that the cumulative incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma is dramatically higher in patients with diabetes. Regarding obesity and overweight, uh, she was overweight already in the early adulthood. And so this is interesting because uh, there are data showing that actually if you have been obese as a child already, you increase your risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma as an adult. And here also we have this uh, nice uh, publication with 162 patients with newly diagnosed hepatocellular carcinoma with 60, 660 as uh, matched. And they look for specifically for uh, adulthood obesity in the 20s and 30s. And you see here that there is in male and in females, when you're obese as a young adult, you increase your risk to develop hepatocellular carcinoma. You'll definitely, so in this patient, this is something you ac expect to happen and you will look for that. And so you, you perform regular uh, screening and then you did uh, the sonography and you found a lesion. Now the question is, is this lesion a hepatocellular carcinoma? So you know that when you have the sonography, and you have a lesion, you have to escalate, and then you have to do uh, other tests, radiological tests with contrast, and you're looking for the typical arterial enhancement and washout during the venous phase, which will actually diagnose hepatocellular carcinoma in patients with cirrhosis. And so what we have here is I wanted to highlight this uh, very nice work actually confirming what has been uh, taken in the, in the uh, guidelines. It's a prospective study of 64 consecutive cirrhotics with nodules detected in the surveillance program. So you have a size which is 16 millimeter. Our patient has 17, so it's exactly the same. They biopsy all these lesions and they found that two thirds of them are hepatocellular carcinoma, but you still have a third which are not yet hepatocellular carcinoma. You have regenerative nodules, dysplastic nodules. But it's very important to look at the different uh, exams that they perform. You have MRI and you have CT. And you have a specificity with the MRI and the CT which is very high. And that's very important because then you can say it's negative in patients who do not have, you know, they don't have hepatocellular carcinoma. So you can put this on a side. And on the other side, you have the sensitivity, which is not very high, is 44%. So you still need to perform biopsy. You know, there's a whole discussion about biopsy or not biopsy. But despite these guidelines, there is frequently the situation when you have to biopsy because the radiology, especially in small lesion, will not tell you exactly what it is. And so then you have to go for the biopsy, in this case, in 56%. So yes, I think definitely I think she has a hepatocellular carcinoma. Thank you very much, Professor Dufour. Yes, she had hepatocellular carcinoma. The patient was resected. Uh, she had a um, liver resection of segment two in November 2013, and the histological confirmation was given of hepatocellular carcinoma. She was she, she was then listed for transplantation. Um, in December 2013. And then she underwent the regular CT scans and MRI scans every three months. Um, a CT scan performed in January 2014 showed a hypervascular lesion in segment 3. Um, this lesion was tased in April 2014 and the following CT uh, showed no HCC lesion. One year after listing, the patient underwent liver transplantation. The therapy of this patient after transplantation of course included immunosuppression with acrolimus and mycophenolate that are the standard of care in our center. Um, the calcineurin inhibitor was then uh, changed for an mTOR inhibitor, everolimus, in September 2015. She also received treatment for her um, other comorbidities including arterial hypertension, diabetes and hyper hypercholesterolemia. This is what I would like to ask to Professor Andrea De Gottardi, is what is the outcome of patient transplanted for NASH and does it differ from patient transplanted for, for adetiologies? Thank you, Christina. Before answering your question, I would like to uh, uh, stress two points. Uh, the first one is that the indication of transplantation in these patients is very good with NASH and HCC. And the second thing is that uh, when you transplant a patient suffering from uh, NASH cirrhosis, you uh, solve the problem of the liver, but you don't solve the other problems, overweight, uh, arterial hypertension, dyslipidemia, and so on. So I would like to draw your attention to uh, a recent study uh, in which uh, uh, an important number of patients, 193, has been followed up uh, for over 12 uh, years 
And these patients has, uh, had uh, NAFLD, and the, the main causes of death in this group of patients was uh, cardiovascular disease in almost 40% of the patients. The other causes included non-liver cancer, about uh, 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 almost 20%. And uh, importantly, complications of cirrhosis and infections uh, represented almost 8% of these patients. And uh, you see that uh, liver transplantation was uh, necessary in 0.5% uh, of these patients. So the question is, uh, in this group of patients, if you transplant them, do you, are you going to do something good or uh, the, the outcome is not, is not very well? And I'm coming to your question. And you see the answer uh, uh, in this uh, data. Uh, representing the cumulative uh, survival in uh, patients transplanted uh, for uh, NASH uh, cirrhosis over the years, up to five years. And you can easily recognize that there are two lines that uh, 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 represent patients that are doing bad. And these uh, two lines are patients with uh, obesity class 3, and uh, this is uh, a, a real problem in, in patients who are transplanted because we are not going to solve this problem. And interestingly, also patients who are uh, underweight. One uh, relevant question is uh, uh, also to know what are the predictors of outcome in this situation. And uh, uh, here on this table, you have uh, uh, a clear indication that uh, NAFLD is a predictor of cardiovascular disease events independently of obesity. And you can see on uh, the right side of the panel that uh, uh, gamma GT is uh, coming out as a significant predictor in, uh, in this context. context. And uh, uh, if you go to the, to the following slide, uh, uh, you can uh, recognize that uh, circulating levels of gamma GT are able to predict cardiovascular disease. On uh, this study of about uh, 7,000 participants with a follow-up of over 10 years, uh, it was uh, demonstrated that uh, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular disease on the left side and stroke on the right side was directly uh, uh, correlated with the levels of gamma GT. And this is confirming that gamma GT is a marker of cardiovascular disease in also in this population of transplanted patients. Thank you very much. So, in effect, uh, something happened to this patient. So she was doing completely fine. And at some point in April 2016, she was uh, hospitalized in the emergency because of a left hemiparesis and she had actually a stroke of the right middle cerebral artery. Um, and this represents exactly what you just told us. Yeah. So to conclude, um, this case illustrates that patients with NAFLD are at risk of negative outcomes and these are liver and non-liver related. So cirrhosis, first of all, as we talked before, but also cancer and cardiovascular events. So we should not um, forget to involve cardiologists and diabetologists with these patients. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answers. Thank you. I learned Thank you. something. <laughs>